Welcome to So I Married a Film Critic, a discussion between a professional film critic and lecturer and me, his wife of 20 years, who just likes to watch movies for fun. I'm your co-host, Julia. And this is Bear the Film Critic. Hello, everyone. And tonight, we decided to continue with our summer movie theme. And do... Yeah, our theme's going to come and go, but <laughs> we'll try to stick with this one. <laughs> um, and do mi- the first Mission Impossible. Yeah, because we got the seventh coming out. Uh, I mean, by the time this airs, I think it'll be out. But yeah, 1996, sorry to step on your words. 1996, this was the first one. That was a big summer, too, because this was the summer of Independence Day. Twister, Eraser, The Rock, The Cable Guy, like I, I was The Frighteners. I was in love with most of the summer movies that came out in '96, and this was the summer that I graduated from high school. I seriously remember this. My last day of high school, the last day we were all in class, it was May 22nd, and I told my teacher, Mr. Huff, super cool guy, and I'm like, hey. Mission Impossible opens tonight. Can I go get tickets? He's like, yeah, go ahead. So I left campus, walked across the street to the Queen Colony Shopping Center, and got a block of tickets for all my buddies to go see Mission Impossible 1 that evening. Wow, you're a really good friend. Did they pay you back? I don't think so. (laughs) I was like living large. Hey, man, you guys want to go see Mission Impossible? I got tickets. I got tickets. (laughs) So yeah, we lined up and we got to the theater, and they had this like yellow police tape and it was basically just the logo of the film and the title and the date, like everywhere. It was like, can't go past this line because Mission Impossible is about to open. So when the first showing started, they let the tape out. We're like, oh my gosh, we're going inside. Like, we got so psyched for this movie. I mean, this was the first big summer film of that that really busy, eventful summer. When I saw this movie in theaters, I came home and told my parents, uh, I didn't get it. <laughs> Yeah, I had a similar thing where I went home. My dad's like, how was that? I'm like, it was awesome. He's like, really? What was it about? I have no idea. Yeah, I had no idea. Yeah. And I don't think I had seen it until we watched it again. Really? It's been that long? Yeah. Wow. I mean, maybe maybe one other time. Because I saw this three times the summer it came out. I, I really loved it. But even after the third time, like, there's still some stuff I don't really get. And when this movie came out on video cassette, widescreen, I think it was like the first time I ever bought like a widescreen video cassette with the, you know, with the letterbox bars. Um, I watched it a lot. I've seen this movie so many times. It's my, it's still my favorite of the, of the series um, for reasons we'll get into. But yeah, I don't think until you and I watched it just, what, last night that finally all the pieces kind of go together. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, well... Let's shows, see how we do. It shows how intelligent we are. <laughs> uh, no, no. It's, it's, it's a very convoluted, complex story. I mean, look, the screenplay, famously, there were a lot of writers that kind of came and went. And there's a lot of guys who are uncredited. Apparently, Steve Zaley, and I heard even David Mammon had a hand in it. But the ones who are credited is David Kep. David Kep famously adapted Jurassic Park into a, a movie. Um, that's probably his most famous calling card. I like a lot of David Kep stuff. And the other writer is Robert Town, the author of Chinatown and the Two Jakes. Robert Town famously writes really complex, convoluted stories. He likes these mysteries where you know you're you're basically in the dark, and even in the end, you're not quite clear how everything connects together. He likes to write these very Raymond Chandler esque mysteries. So there's, you know, on the one hand, it's cool because the movie wants you to be in the dark about a lot of things because there's a lot of surprises, but. Yeah, this is one of those movies where famously nobody really understood what it was about when it came out. And I, I think I, I think it, it is explainable. It's not incomprehensible. It's just really complex. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, our film opens up in Kiev and... Kiev? Well, you can say it either way. Yeah, you can. You sure? Yeah. You think the people in Kiev are um, oh upset right gosh. now? Oh, my gosh. I think All it's right. Kiev. I think it is Kiev. Whatever. Okay. So um, we have Emilio Estevez like watching a little tiny screen. And what's basically going down is like everybody is acting and trying to get information out of this guy. And I mean, it's in like, like they create like a fake set for this situation. But one of the CIA agents, Claire, I mean, she's like really dying. Mm hmm. Like she's well, poisoned. she's under. Yeah, she's under, and she needs like basically like an injection to take her out of this. And by the way, we, you and I watched this for about what four minutes, and like, what is going on? <laughs> so I had to rewind all the way back to the beginning because I'm like, I can't quite ex- get a watch. Like, I don't, I don't. What 
is happening? Like, never mind. Let's just let's start this scene over again. <laughs> Oh, you were man. very frustrated. It's like going back to when I was 16. Okay. So they get the guy to talk and um, Ethan Hunt, played by Tom Cruise, gives Claire the injection and she finally comes to. And I, did you feel like there was a little chemistry between them? Yeah. I mean, there's there's more to be said about that. But I mean, I guess I could see it right now. There originally was a different opening scene or rather a longer opening scene. It used to be the scene where Ethan and Claire were basically kind of going back and forth between the scenario that we see and a moment where they're in the elevator and they start to make out. Oh. They cut that because for timing and they cut it. I, I, mean, I don't even know why they cut it, but it becomes an important piece of the film that's referenced late in the film. Um, thou shalt not cover with another man's wife. Oh, uh, yeah. A character is really saying that. Apparently these two, <clears throat> excuse me, were really having an affair. And the film dials that down by losing the opening scene. Oh, you know what? That would make way more sense if we had seen them actually making out in an elevator. Because I was like, like he doesn't 100% seem into her. Yeah, Ethan Hunt is kind of a ladies' man, James Bond type, really. And uh, we, yeah, we... Apparently, De Palma devised, as he always does, this, this really complex shot. You know, where I think it was like a one or like a one shot of going back and forth between the scenario that they're acting out and having to play, versus who they are behind the scenes. And of course, as we know later on, she's married to Jim Phelps, the head of the IMF Impossible Mission Force team. He is not here, so this is the kind of shenanigans that goes on when when yeah when Jim when Phelps isn't Jim's around. Jim's out of town. Yeah. Um, okay, so the whole IMF team is kind of sitting around a table, and Jim, played by John Boyd, is on an airplane. He's kind of briefing them on their next mission. Um, so basically, there's this list of CIA, every CIA operative in the world, and it's like two discs. One has their like code name, and one has their real names. And then um, if they if someone has both list the discs yeah. then they Your they business. got they got everything yeah. but i'm like well if you have their real names like do you really need the code names sure why because you got to know like okay that dude's the panther we're trying to find the panther and, <laughs> yeah man that squiggy mcsquiggles but his real name is john ford and he lives in milwaukee yeah you gotta you gotta have both lists uh, you gotta right. know who these guys are all right so the mission is to try to get photographic evidence of the man trying to get this list the man's name is galitzen right yeah yeah Litson. i think that the screenwriters are like what's the most underrated of santa's elves galitzen we're gonna use Gal galitzen here we go <laughs> No one's ever used that name before. Okay, good. We're good. Okay, so they're preparing like for the party because they're going to have to go to this party and everyone well, hold has... on. Hold on. What? So, so Jim Phelps, John Voight, he's on the plane. Yeah. He lists, He watches, you know, the it's like a video as well as the message that Kittredge, played but wonderfully by Henry oh, Kazernzi, okay. is giving him. And this message will self-destruct. The message self-destructs. And it's like this huge gust of smoke, and suddenly John Voight lets like he's smoking. I'm like, oh, that's right. This is back when people could smoke on planes. Yeah, because otherwise, I'm thinking like because I'm remembering Get Smart, which is a James Bond parody where this message will self destruct. It'd be like this huge explosion, yeah, or like, huge explosion, or like Inspector Gadget, right? I'm like on a plane, this this thing is gonna self destruct. You know, it's just like, tss, yeah, you know. Yeah, I thought that it was just it was interesting. I thought they handled it well and they make it plausible because oh yeah, this is 1996. People like like okay, token away on Marlboro. In 96 people were not smoking on planes. Sure they were. Where only in first class then? Well, obviously he's not in coach with the rest of the cattle. This is Jim yeah. Phelps. Yeah, that's true. Well, I'm just saying. In my life, I've never seen anyone smoke on planes. Well, plus where is he coming from? To like you know. I mean, there are still like he's coming from. He was just in Chicago at the Drake Hotel. Ah, uh, you're right. Mm -hmm. That's a key detail. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, we'll circle back to that. Yeah. So he tells them like, "Oh yeah, I'm, I was at the hotel," and they're like, "Oh, you were probably the swanky place." And they're trying to guess where he was, and he tells them it was the Drake Hotel. It's almost like the screenwriters like audience, pay attention to this detail. We're going to say Drake Hotel five more times, just yeah. so like, you, like <laughs> don't forget. Okay. Okay. Do you want to go over who like is on the team? Dum, 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 dum. <laughs> sure. What what I like about this is, I mean, there's no chance in heck this has happened, but 
if you perchance walk into this movie and you don't know who Tom Cruise is, you wouldn't think he's the star of the movie. I like the way he's positioned in the opening scenes. It really feels like it's an Emilio Estevez it movie. It does. That's what's great. And clearly De Palma's like, I'm going to psycho this, all right? We're going to get the audience to think that Emilio Estevez, as Jack Harmon, by the way, great name, Jack Harmon, is the star because he is he's the first character introduced. He is literally in the center of the frame. And when it comes to the introductory scene, Cruz, as Ethan Hunt is sitting in the back, he is brash, he's abrasive, he's clearly like the the what, the the stud guy who does sort of the Oh, he's a master of disguise. But like Jack Harmon, played by Estevez, he seems like more of the the team leader when Phelps isn't around. He really does. And because yeah. he's, you know, in the room overseeing the play acting that's happening in the opening scene, yeah, so it's it's great. So De Palma again. He's clearly like, I'm okay. Worked for Janet Lee. I'm gonna do this with Amelia Westevez. Which is funny because I was like, hey, why isn't he in more of these movies? Which we find out. Clearly, you have not seen this movie since 1996. Because <laughs> if anything, if anything, anyone who's seen this movie remembers that I mean, the West of his exits this movie like Steven Seagal and Executive Decision. It's like, wow. Yeah, it's Fact pretty. Yeah, same year. Same year. It's pretty in fact. brutal. Yeah, it's good. No, it's 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 shocking. So yeah, so yeah, you've got Tom Cruise as Ethan Hunt. You've got Emmanuel Bert as Claire Phelps. We'll talk more about Emmanuel Bert. Um, Let's see, at this point, it's Kristen Scott Thomas, very briefly in this movie. And this was the same year as The English Patient, but that had not come out yet. And then you got Ingeborg de Putzneite, I did not say that right, <laughs> as Hannah. Ingeborg, <laughs> you're great in this movie. I apologize for butchering your last name. And I think that's it. Yeah, that's yeah, it. That's, that's it. the team. That's the team. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, so they're, um, they're waiting for Jim to basically fly in and they're all getting ready with like disguises and outfits and Emilio Estevez um has made a new kind of gun yeah where (laughs) he's like you take the red side and the green side and you just put them together and then it explodes I'm like that feels really dangerous like well the the, to have a piece of gum in your pocket the great the great capper of the season goes don't chew it excellent point yeah wouldn't you forget well i was thinking like oh do you chew it and then like your saliva like activates no 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 that's no you just gotta push them together no but seriously i mean that's i mean that's a good way to get your head to explode you do that yeah okay but i also have the glasses with the camera yeah, that is also a, yeah, a plot detail, very important. I got to say, like this seemed a little ahead of its time in 96, not so much anymore. This is kind of boring now. Yeah, I I was like, wow, that's the only gadgets they have? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you know what, though? Because, you know, again, it's De Palma, and he's so persnickety about detail and about creating set pieces um, and a real master visualist, and, I, and it's all over this film. You know what they had to do for those scenes where a character is looking at another character, and then you're seeing the video readout in the back. You know they shot it separately. Yeah. So that actor had to be exact. When, okay, like when you're looking at Emilio, like you look to the left, you look to the right, you you dodge your head for a little bit. Like it's it's exact because, uh, you know, on the one hand, there's great special effects in this movie, but some of this is just old school, no frills, just regular movie magic. Yeah. So they're at the party and they all this have... This big party in uh, Prague. Yeah. So they all have very specific roles. And I think my favorite part was... When Kristen Scott Thomas, she has this like perfume and she's supposed to spray the back of Glitzen's head. It's great. Yeah, this is a cool shot. Yeah. So that he, as they're, they're watching him through their like black and white camera or whatever, he has like a big yellow, like cloud following him. Yeah. It looks like Dennis Rodman's hair. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. And I was like, oh, well that was Okay. That's a cool visual. Magic perfume. And what's really wonderful about this sequence where we're cutting to all the different IMF agents all over the the mansion on their assignments and on their missions, the film cuts back to it. And the second time we see it, it's very Rashomon effect because you're realizing, oh, I should have paid attention to this extra and this extra and this extra. Yes. The film really, I mean, you know, like, like any film, but especially this one, it really pays to pay attention, uh, to really lean in. Yeah. Uh, so Emilio Estevez is like hanging out on top of the elevator mm. and he's kind of doing, 
I don't know. He's the computer geeky guy yeah. in the movie. Um, cause Kristen Scott Thomas is with Cruz and he's, he's Cruz in some pretty elaborate Rob Bottin makeup. Yeah. I, mean, I love that part of it. That, that's a part of the movie. No one ever talks about like Cruz is doing some wacky character work at some point. Um, I mean, most of them have Southern accents and they're politicians. Okay. But still it's like, this is cool. Cruz is doing the stuff that, you know, we really wouldn't see him do until Tropic Thunder. Yeah. So, you know, there's like checking of fingerprints and then Emilio Estevez is like making sure that their IDs check out, you know, going on elevators and... The banter is witty. The feeling is, you know, like it's a very elegant movie, but it does, I mean, it it feels like the TV show, respectfully. Like it feels, okay, this is what Mission Impossible was. It was an ensemble piece. Cruz is not dominating this movie. This is clearly what the TV show is and Jim Phelps is overseeing it. Um, And then things take a turn. Yeah. So, well, so what Cruz and Chris and Scott Thomas do is they have to set up his glasses in the room so they can film Glitzen, you know, getting the the list that they call the knock list. So he's got, he puts his glasses down, you know, and then it's like, oh no. It's got to be an easier way to do this, by the way. I don't know that. I mean, it's, I think it's probably a thing like for the screenwriters, a convenient way to keep the plot going, but yeah. Yeah. It's like, got to get the glasses in place. Like maybe a teddy bear is a little, you know, a a little, a teddy bear, a teddy bear with glasses, a a teddy bear with a camera. A nanny cam. Yes, exactly. I think glasses, I mean, like somebody's going to be, Hey, did you guys lose these? (laughs) <laughs> I mean, don't you don't you think some you know if I find glasses or like a f- cell phone at a party? I know, but there was so much stuff in that room in that office that I don't know that I would have noticed. The party's like a back party, like oh yeah, Tom and Tina went in the back room. Nobody goes back there. Yeah, you're right. It, it might be one of those parties where it's like yeah, no one's gonna, <laughs> no one's gonna go. <laughs> okay, and... it's not eyes wide shut. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> but the thing that was weird about it is like. Why is this, why do they know that Glitzen is going to be going into this room and like doing this like secret stuff with this list? How do they know that? It's Glitzen's favorite computer. I guess. And there's a poster of Claudia Schaeffer right above the computer. So they know (laughs) that's where Glitzen's going to go. Okay. So I don't know. Then the, there's just some like weird timing with them leaving the room and being so they have to like go through the elevator it's shaft. It's very convenient plotting. Yes. Yeah, and and for some reason, Emilio Estevez thought it was a wise idea to be perched on top of this elevator for the entire mission. Yeah, and then he ends up okay. The spikes that are at the top of the elevator shaft. I mean, is that someone put those there? Right. Uh, I I think the implication is that they're there as like a fail safe so that it doesn't come crashing into the top of the ceiling. Oh. I think those are technically the brakes. I don't know that, no, that those are not brakes. Those are murder weapons. <laughs> if you're on top of the elevator, yes, definitely. But I mean, they're like spikes. So what? The alternative would be either someone either put those there to like because you know we find out there's some double agents, so they either put them there on purpose to murder him. Mm-hmm. Or what? Like the elevator is gonna be stopped by that, and they're gonna. I don't. I do think it's a part of the elevator's mechanisms. It seems like a lot to knowing what we know about the movie that somebody would, would go up there, those? install. Like, okay, he's got to be in this elevator shaft at this time, and if <laughs> if anybody else, if anybody, you know, if okay, the ele- but but like when because remember that elevator's out of commission for the rest of that that party. Right, but then when he like go, I mean, it seems like the elevator like speeds yeah. towards that. Yeah, in that sense, it is rigged. Yes, yeah. or it rigged in the sense that a computer is just controlling the speed of it. I think that's plausible. Yeah, but what you're saying, I don't. I I I feel like it's it's up there to like stop it. It's like stab it to a stop. Stab, stab it. To stop. A stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then the people inside. Get that elevator, elevator out of control. Thank you. We get those stab stoppers up there. Otherwise, that thing would have gone through the roof. <laughs> gosh i know and then like people inside the elevator like oh my gosh i was almost stabbed i was almost stab stopped oh yeah. man i don't like those stab stopping elevators oh yeah but no when emilio eats it this early in the movie and he's clearly the most likable character in the film yeah i mean clearly De Palma's like aha got you finally my psycho mine <laughs> I know, because I I was like, oh man, like I really like Emilio Estevez. Oh, everybody in the theater was stunned. It's like Mighty Ducks, yeah, Coach. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, that's why he's not in any future Mission Impossible's. <laughs> oh, okay, that's a bummer, big bummer. 
Yeah. Okay, so... So Jack Harmon exits the film, and they continue with their mission. Um, but, you know, the team is is rattled by this, as we are. Um, oh, yeah. Well, yeah. So they go outside, Cruz and... Um, Cruz and Kristen Scott Thomas yeah. are still uh, pursuing Galitzin, who's out in the open now. Yeah. So they're outside pretending to be like a couple in the... Making in, out. In the mist. And... Um, God, I love spy work. I know, man. I miss those days. <laughs> um, so then Jim calls abort um because he gets attacked so you know he at what cruz has this like special watch and he can like see what yeah, jim is so seeing. jim is wearing the special glasses so we see you know he's got blood in his hands apparently he's been stabbed and he falls off a ledge and and eats it yeah and then the movie becomes like jack the ripper for a few minutes it's pretty cool because it's you know it's Prague, but you know it's it's foggy and it's outside and there's cobblestones and people are just getting stabbity stabbed. Well, and and ex- it's also explosions. And the thing is that Cruz is telling Kristen Scott Thomas like, no, she's like, he said abort. We're supposed to walk away, and he's like, no, we're gonna finish this. Mission. I would have been like, we need to make out just for like five more minutes. Okay, just play along. Play along. <laughs> Here, I got some gum. You want some gum? <laughs> Is that your explosive gun? Wait, wait, wait. okay. Ho, ho, ho. Okay, is this the Wrigley's or the <sighs> Talk on it? Okay. <laughs> if it's got one color, we're good. You want half? <laughs> we'll go have these on this. <laughs> what if you just like ripped the explosive gum apart and you each took a half? Be like, does this taste like gunpowder to you? <laughs> oh, it's funny. Okay, so Cruz is basically like running all around this area. He and- ditches Kristen Scott Thomas, which he should not have done. That's not cool. And he, this is like, this is the impetuous young man that Ethan Hunt is at this point. It's like, no, 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 I'm used to things working out. And this is a guy who's used to working under the gun, under the clock. It's always worked out for him. So I get it why he runs off, but like he never should have left his team member like that, especially since it's an ambush. Yeah, but he he doesn't know. Well, I guess he does know that. Because, he does, yeah, yeah because yeah, he yeah, knows because Jim is eating so, it. So, so like yeah. Jim's gone. He falls off a bridge. Claire's car explodes. Sarah gets killed, and they, um, along with the guy they were following, he also glitches. he gets killed. And yeah, and, and interestingly enough, in his pocket where the knuckles used to be, there's just blood everywhere. Yeah, it's it's great. Yeah, and it's then great. Kristen Scott Thomas gets stabbed and. Finally, the the disc is gone. And I got to say, like, this is where, like, oh, man, I see this now. De Palma is making a Hitchcock movie, but he's not making Psycho and he's not making Vertigo, which is what he's done a lot, respectively. He's making one of those man on the run. He's making North by Northwest. He's making one of those North by Northwest or the uh, man who knew too much. He's making one of those Hitchcock films where the lead character is on the run. He is an innocent man. He's been declared guilty and he literally has blood in his hands. There's that great shot where Cruz actually touches the knife, which is you should not do. And he's got blood in his hands. And at that very moment, that's when the police siren, uh, you hear it and someone in a boat is shining a light on him it's like oh man this is this is that kind of hitchcock film that de palma is doing and it's oh it's so exciting because you know he he's done the perverse sexual thrillers but mm-hmm. he's he really hadn't done a movie quite like this before on this kind of budget so yeah so we're off and running literally at this point and cruz finds his way to a payphone and man, I do love this low tech thing of going to the payphone, taking this the speaker off, and having to put it like a weird yeah. What is it? A voice modifier, probably. I don't know, but he has to call in and like have a code, and then they like they switch to all a secure have line. Codes. It, I love this stuff from spy movies. Like the ice is hot, but the road is slippery. Okay access you know like like these weird because i mean the idea is that you're saying something that's completely unnatural so it can't be like hey the password is spy game 29 oh you know it's like no it's like the daisies are in bloom but the dog needs to be fed okay right this way light this match and look at the corner and go you know it's like it's, it's these weird you know yeah but he yeah. freaks out he's like my team is dead and oh, you, have, great. you know and he's like okay we're going to bring you in, you know, meet me at this restaurant. So I just, I love that he, you know, he's been like very careful to elude the bad guys. And, but don't you think the bad guys would be looking for a guy in a payphone going, well, they're dead. Yeah, they're all dead. That's what I was 
just thinking because they're like, have you been followed? And he's like, I don't think so. Like, uh, I don't know. They're, they're dead, okay? Yeah, it's great. Oh, man. And he's like, just he's Anyone l- within his like cool. a 10 block radius could hear this guy. Mommy, why is there a man screaming into a payphone? <laughs> yeah. I know. And then he's like, are you sure you haven't been followed? He's like, yes. <laughs> I think I'm still alive. Yeah, yeah, and then he uh, Kittredge and his Kittredge, and he says, you know, meet me at this location, and 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 it's and, like this really weird restaurant. Oh, this restaurant's awesome! It's this giant aquarium. Yeah, where yeah, you're just like sitting in front of like this humongous well, fish tank. Well, it's a fish tank, and then you sit like around it. Okay, so he finds out that this whole operation was. A mole hunt, which yeah. is a line that I could not hear the first couple times I saw this film. Oh. <laughs> because even though Tom Cruise is screaming, they are dead! They are all dead! In the scene with Henry Kazernsky, he goes, there's a mole hunt. This whole thing was a mole hunt. Like, what are you... No, please, Mr. Cruise, please you speak up. Enunciate. Yeah, no, no. I mean, you know, and we're watching it with subtitles, but no, I, I swear, I saw this film three times in the theater, summer of 96. You never knew? Not to the third time, Can I? because I was sitting next to my friend Janelle Morocco, and she was oh. going, <gasps> I'm like, Janelle, what did he say? She's like, oh my goodness. She was like freaking out about it. I'm like, I can't hear what he's saying. <laughs> I just know that they're all dead. That's all I know. And she's like, Barry, it's okay. I know how to read lips. <laughs> <laughs> so this scene is a masterclass. I've shown this movie, excuse me, I've shown this scene in particular to film classes because if you want to use a Dutch angle, this is how you do it. Mm-hmm. Dutch angle is where the, the, the camera is tilted. And initially it's a scene between Cruz and Henry Kazernzi and it's this thing, it's like, you know, initially it's this thing, man, bummer that everyone's dead. Mm-hmm. Bummer, okay, we'll get you back. You know, don't worry, we'll take care of you. And then as as Ethan Hunt is talking to Kittredge, realizes, okay, I'm actually being taken in because you think I'm the guy, you think I'm the one who killed my team members, and, you know. And the camera gets incredibly close to these actors, and it's at this insane tilt, making you feel uncomfortable. Mm. It's using the the visuals to make you feel like the discomfort that's going on. Um, And then it's not the first, it's one of two times in the movie that Cruz admirably remembers the gum, he well, re- but but first, before that, he <laughs> yep. recognizes everybody in the restaurant. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, he's looking around. He's noticing. Yeah, like how, what's what's with the second IMF team? And we realized, yeah, the whole thing that they had went through was a mole hunt. The entire mm-hmm. thing. Um, and thinking, they, and they flash back to the party. So yeah, we and we're see, seeing. Yeah, 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 seeing all the extras. Sorry, um, but yeah, it's 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 interesting because you learn. Oh, okay. They just they thought that Ethan would show his hand. They didn't think that in their mind, in the way they see it, that Ethan would murder his entire team. And now he's here at the restaurant and like, yeah, we got him. We got this guy. Yeah. So he he pulls the gum out of his, out of his pocket when he realizes he needs to escape. And I'm thinking like, man, if it was me, I'd be like, okay, is this the explosive gum or is this the Bubba Yeba? <laughs> Because it's kind of embarrassing if they're, if they're like, see you in hell, and you put the gum on the on the thing and then nothing happens. No. That'd be really embarrassing. <laughs> then the waitress comes over and just like gives you a stink eye. Well, he's got, he's got that killer line where the like, kitchen, you've never seen me this upset. And he wads the gum up and he throws it against the, the glass of the aquarium. And suddenly the whole restaurant basically just explodes with water. It's yeah. so cool. It's pretty cool. And apparently Cruz really did this and he's told this funny story about like, okay, but am I running on one or two or three? So just run on two. Like one, two. Apparently like the water was just like everywhere and he's just like, I gotta get out. Yeah, he just ran for his life and you actually see that in the film. It was shot in a sound stage and it's in slow motion. I mean, it's a fantastic shot. Love it. The gum first explodes. A guy like bursts through the window. It's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's very exciting. Apparently, no fish were killed during the making of this film, but we'll never know. We'll never know. Okay, so he goes back to kind of their safe house. Safe house, yeah. yeah. And he's like putting glass in the hallway. Like, Smart guy. Why does he think he's going to hear that? He does, though. Yeah, I he mean, does. He shatters the 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 bulb and he shatters glass everywhere. And then later on, he's like. Okay, and that's but when is he there knows nobody that there. else that lives in this on this floor? <laughs> you think he's gonna hear the glass, open the door, and it's gonna be like the night lady, and he's gonna like <laughs> snap her neck? Well, I'm like, ah, oh, like, sorry, wrong, wrong door. No, no, like, is there anybody that else that lives like next door? It's a safe house. It's probably, I mean, probably that's the idea. Like, this is a you know part of the. No one goes up here. 
Okay. This is where they keep the, you know, the mops and the... There's no, like, old lady who's, like, trying to just, like, get back to her apartment after, you know, visiting her daughter. That'd be awesome. You hear, like, it's her, it's like her walker shattering all the glass. It's like, there's an army out there. There's seven of them. (laughs) I'm just here for my grandson. It's like, don't worry. It's just, you know, Martha. (laughs) Okay, so he goes back and he's like furiously trying to solve this mystery, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so how does he find the Job Job oh Job 315? Yes. So he thinks There's a connection to Max the Arms Dealer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We know that Max the Arms Dealer is the person who hired uh someone who goes by Job 315. Right. So this movie <laughs> uses this plot device i don't know <laughs> well it's funny it because completely work. he's using some like really beginner's version of the internet oh it's, it's the like, best the search engines are <laughs> yeah. like it's like guys with hats seven people come up you know yeah it's it's you know this is clearly like the you know the infancy of the internet being mainstream by the way this movie this is the first time i ever went to a website because the first this is a, this is true historically we know that the first movie to ever have its own website was Stargate, and that was 1994. It was the most rudimentary, you know, ancient website where it was just like this 8-bit picture of, of a scene from Stargate, and it had like this information about the cast, and that was it. The Mission Impossible website, they actually advertised in magazines, and it was a shot of Tom Cruise hanging, and he was like, you know, uh, but he was, um, you know, typing on a keyboard, and it was like, go to the Mission Impossible website. And the Mission Impossible website, I don't know if it's still if it's still floating out there in cyberspace, but like... It was amazing because it was like 8-bit pictures of the movie. And it was like these really, like, you could barely even see what the pictures were. And if you wanted to download the QuickTime trailer, you you hit play. And it only took about two hours to watch a two-and-a-half-minute trailer. It was awesome. Yeah, and we, we loved it. Because we all had dial-up and... Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, Mission Impossible. So he's, like, falling asleep at this laptop trying to solve this mystery. And then he looks up and there's a Bible... And he's like, oh, Her? maybe it's not Job, but maybe it's, it's Job. Job. Okay, he like opens up the Bible and just automatically finds the book of Job. No way. There's He doesn't even look at the table of contents. I call BS. Ethan Hunt does not know where the you don't a, know, any he, books of the Bible are. He could are. be a theologian. No. He might have gone to Catholic school. No. He could be like the saint. He could be like Simon Templar. <laughs> maybe they were, maybe they were school baits. <laughs> Can't you see, like, Tom Cruise and, like, Val Kilmer in the same Catholic school together? I guess. But, like, come on. How many years ago would that have been? They're about the same age. Remember, they were in Top Gun together. Okay, I'm just saying. He's, what, in his late 20s? They both coincidentally decided to become super spies. <laughs> and they're both masters of the skies. There you go. Oh, my God. <laughs> And the saint did come out a year later, so there you go. So then Hunt emails every Max he finds on the internet? Is that... That's pretty ridiculous, yeah. And he's like, guten tag and Max and Z. Yeah, he's like, he's typing out like every language. Yeah. Like trying to find this person. Well, I mean, he is, you know, he's a James Bondian sort of spy. Like he knows, he probably speaks multiple languages and... Okay, and he's you also know. a Bible scholar. And a, but, yeah, see, exactly. It, you know, those IMF, you know, you got to be of a certain caliber, you know. Mm. You got to be able to lead a Bible study, and you got to be able to be bilingual to be in the IMF. He's, yeah, no, he's like quadrillion lingual. He's like knows so many languages. Yeah, and he does quite well. And he does accents, too, and he gets these amazing masks. Where? We don't know. We don't know. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, how does he make these masks? We never see any of that. Yeah, I mean, he's apparently like Rick Baker. He's got like his little makeup studio and he does these these perfect approximations the um the third film does show the technology because there's in the third movie he impersonates philip seymour hoffman who was the bad guy in the movie and you actually see how the mask is sort of digitally made and it's fairly cool but yeah in this in this movie like where is he coming up with this stuff yeah well i see that's the thing does he just have like a john voight mask just in case yeah no there's no way it's like for his birthday i'm gonna surprise him i mean it would have taken forever for somebody to actually make a mask and so i don't think i think that's why the movie like does not show us that stuff oh it's very fast and loose obviously with some of these details okay so then claire arrives 
It's like Claire's alive and he doesn't really. What's so weird, it, I think it works. And it's, you know, for a movie that's so dialogue heavy, I think it's wise that they move as quick as they do because first it's a, it's a fake out nightmare sequence. Mm-hmm. And then it quickly becomes, oh, he was asleep and now he's woken up and, you know, he's on his feet and he's, you know, crazed with exhaustion. So he sees Claire and he immediately busts out a gun and thrusts it in her face. And, you know, this is the one Mission Impossible movie where Ethan Hunt doesn't shoot anybody. Oh. In fact, other than Taps and Born on the Fourth of July, I think at this point Cruz had never fired a gun in a movie. And, of course, by the time they get to Mission Impossible 2, it's like, Ethan, do you accept this mission? Do I? <laughs> <laughs> the second movie, I mean, it's, it's guns blazing, like, top to bottom. So she kind of is like, we said we'd be back here at 4 a.m. no matter what. Oh, yeah. 400, you know, and I was like, oh, that's true. You know, she's just being a good spy. And so he finally like believes her yeah. that she's not the mole. He has an excellent point, though. I, like, I saw you blow up in the car. Like, that's a little suspicious. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's suspicious. But she's like, no, I, I got out of the car. So. You know what I would have done? I would have been like making sure it wasn't a mask. Because <laughs> he like frisks her. I'd be like, no, no, check the neck, man. Make sure that's not like some latex. Yeah, that's true. I think <laughs> it's really John Voight. <laughs> oh, bummer. Oh, man. I thought it was Claire. Okay, so Hunt is going to try to meet Max so that he can then find Job. Yeah, infiltrate Job. Yeah. Because yeah. Job is the one who put all this in motion. Right. And so he meets Max to er- and earns her trust, and um, she's a wild thing. <laughs> <laughs> she's played by Vanessa Redgrave, who's, who's terrific in this role. But yeah, she is hot for Ethan. Yeah. And I got to say, like, I forgot how flirty um, she is during the scenes. Like, she's not doing the thing where every line is a, is a double entendre. But she really wants to. You really feel like they're, they're both actors are leading into it. And it's great. It's great. It's very surprising, obviously. And it's cool because the Vanessa, Vanessa Redgrave's character, Max, or even Maxine, or whatever, whatever her name really is, we don't know who she is in her life. We don't know if she's a politician. We don't know if whatever. She's a, she's a second grade teacher. Like we, we don't know. We just know she has an awesome office and clearly she's surrounded by opulence and she's able to, you know, hold on to this, uh, you know, to, to this fake life. Um, yeah, the character is fascinating, but um, clearly she doesn't flirt with most of her spies. So I think she's just delighted to have this little boy toy that suddenly she's like, oh, you're adorable. <laughs> Yes, you nicknamed her Cougar Max. Cougar Max, yes. <laughs> Who are you and what are you doing here? I need $150,000. What? So <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> you, and you thought if you simply showed up, I might give it to you? <laughs> Why not? You gave Job 125 Mm, the penny drops. You are not Job. Job is not given to quoting scripture in his communications. Then there was its tone, aggressive but playful. Job is not playful. So you are something of a paradox. Well, that depends. On what? Whether you like a paradox. I want $150,000 today. Ah, oh, no, that's quite out of the question. The disc Job sold you, it's worthless. It's bait, part of an internal mole hunt. And how might you know that? You another company man? Like Job? Hmm. We're asking about you. I'm Nock. Was. Now, disavowed. Why, may I ask? That is the question I want to ask Job. I don't know Job any more than Job knows me. Even so, I'm sure you could arrange an introduction. Why should I? Because I can deliver the actual Nock list. 
The one you have is not only worthless, it's certain to be equipped with a homing device to pinpoint your exact location. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Boot it up. In anywhere from 30 seconds to 10 minutes, you'll have Virginia farm boys hopping around you like jackrabbits. It's easy to say the disc is worthless when you say I can't look at the information and see if it's worthless. Not a tenable position, sir. Okay, use it. But I'd suggest you pack first. Okay, so she does have what she thinks is the real disc. Yeah, the knockless, right. And he's like... If you put that in there, you're going to have the Yeah, it's CIA a fake. Here. And yeah, exactly. You got like a few minutes tops before someone bangs the door down. And she doesn't believe him. And then the CIA show up. And so he makes a deal with her to get the real disc in exchange yeah. for money and Job. So we got that in motion. So then uh, Ethan goes back to Claire and says, we got to get a team together. And that's when we... We get our second ensemble. Yeah. So they search the disavowed agents list. Yes. And Claire apparently pulls in uh, Krieger, played by Jean Renault. And from the disavowed list, you get Luther Stickle, uh, who's played in the movie by Ving Rhames. In fact, he's in every single Mission Impossible film. Yeah. He's one of the only threads. Oh, yeah. Ving Rhames is great. Okay. So their next mission is they have to break into the CIA and get the list from this like top secret room that only one dude has access to. And they show this by basically showing this poor schmuck (laughs) his day to day of how miserable his office existence is where he has to go through a retinal scan, a voice scan, has to go like Like put in like two separate. Oh man. Just, yeah. Just really like it just tedious just getting to and fro his office. How does the secretary get in there? Cause she's like right outside of his main office where the list is like she's a hologram she's not real oh okay yeah well i mean he goes in there and then it's like he puts his stuff down then and then he's like i think i'm gonna go uh read the paper somewhere else it's like after all that it took you like 25 minutes well we also see that that the room they need to get into this room because that's where the list is on this this laptop or what would, what would just be a computer? Yeah. Well, not a laptop, computer. And apparently at one point, this guy, this poor, poor guy, he leaves his cold drink on the counter and a drop of the cold drink sets off the alarm. I mean, <laughs> they must hate this guy. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Dunlow, I guess. Is oh, his name. freaking Dunlow, man. Yeah. God. It's like... <sighs> one more time, Dunlow, and that's it, man. You're going back to... You're going to wash the, the desk at the end of the day, man. And I'm like, what is he doing in there? <laughs> Because, like, <laughs> it's a computer with this list. Like, what else is going on on this computer? It's like, you have one job done, though. You just got to like, make sure nobody gets into your office but you. That's all That's all you got to do. Just, you know, you're, yeah. And it has to stay at, like, 70 a certain temperature, yeah. degrees. Yeah. And there's, it, I was like, this would be a nightmare situation. Yeah, yeah. Me. And it's, it's why it's like, yeah, it's, it's. It lives up to the film's title. It's I'm so like, it's ugh. such a ridiculous. I have uh, to go to the bathroom again. I don't want to do this. Can you guys put <laughs> the porter potty in here? No. <laughs> oh man, no. Just to be yeah, just to be done low, man. Yeah, like I, I like that. For us to understand how how crazy this mission is, we see his like his miserable. If Dilbert worked, you know, for British Secret Service, like for James Bond, this mm. is what it would be like. Yeah. Like man, this sucks. It's kind of like the other guys, you know. Yes. It's like this is like the like the like the Wolf Ferrell character and the other guys. Like <laughs> everyone's out like getting all the action, doing all the cool stuff, and this guy's just at his desk like, hey guys, how's it going? He's just like crunching numbers all oh, yeah. day. Like, wow, accounting is exciting. I bet like when he walks past the secretary, he's like, Oh, Sheila, Sheila noticed my tie today. Yeah. Oh, it's the best thing that happened to me. Well, oh, well he retinal d- scan time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now the team is gonna dun, infiltrate. Dun dun mm-hmm. dun. So Claire's job is to go in and like tag Dunlow so that um, Luther can track him, his movements. The user is the honeypot. Yeah. Good choice. Of course. So she like sits next to him and he doesn't even really look at her though. I'm like. He's keeping it cool. He is. But in the instance, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. (laughs) Girl with glasses. I have glasses too. So she just like keeping it cool. Good yeah. job, Dunlow. So she just like puts this tiny little tag on his shoulder, and he's like, he's like oh, "She touched me." No, he doesn't even oh really God. know that she touched him. <laughs> he does. He, he notices, and they make eye contact. She gives him a little smile, and it's like you know, 
she's making like it's this innocent little office thing. It's like, oh my god, are we going out? Are we going out? <laughs> are you my girlfriend now? <laughs> okay, so she's then she also takes her pen and like sprays something in his coffee. Yes. And that was like Do you think it's like toilet water considering what we know? I mean it's probably it's probably the most rancid stuff. Ugh, it's it's something. It's like This is nineteen ninety six. Maybe it's like remnants of like new coke. <laughs> or like tab, like a tab soda that hasn't been opened since the eighties. Like some like a little bit of poison hmm. because he gets the tummy troubles. Oh, big time. Pretty bad. Yeah, it's pretty and very quickly yeah. too. Very yeah. impressive. And then meanwhile, there's this bit where Ethan and Krieger sneak into Lagley dressed as firefighters. Yeah. And I'm sure like Cruz in a firefighter album, I would have loved to have that outtake where the secretary's like, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> right this way. Yeah. But yeah, they they're getting changed into their into their thievery outfits. And a security guard goes in there and Ethan infiltrates Creaker killing him, and it's a very important detail that he basically stops him in mid stab. Wait, what? Remember when Ethan says no body count? Remember, like Krieger's about oh. to kill the guy, and he, he smacks his knife against the wall, oh, like holding yeah, him yeah, in yeah, place. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so they end up inside the ceiling, and they're kind of going through the Damn. yeah, the John McClaning it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Come out to the coast; we'll have a few laughs. Well, I love that. I mean, it's a really complicated shot. Clearly, I mean, you know, I mean, the cinematography in this thing is just fantastic. So, like, the shot is, you know, Cruz goes into the shot, and he's climbing, 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 and he's going through the the what the duct. The, yeah, the ducts. And uh, you know, and then he finally banks left and goes off camera. And then you got Jean Renault behind him, but the but basically it just it cuts before he comes into frame, and it's like, oh poor Jean Renault. <laughs> you gotta follow Tom Cruise and go through that hole, and then it's like, all right, go back to your go back to position A. Like that must have been a sucky day. He's like, it's so hot in here, I'm not even on camera. It's like, oh, Cruise isn't even climbing that fast. Talk on it. So they have to like Although I do remember seeing this in the theater with Janelle, mm-hmm. and this is when she's like, Oh my god, look at how big his muscles are. <laughs> Oh my god, he really worked out. Like in far and away, his muscles weren't that big, but look at that. Like, Janelle, well, I'm trying to follow these are the, the plot. These the kinds of conversations you're having during Mission Impossible. Of course you couldn't understand what was going I on. I know. I'm like, Janelle, I'm trying to follow the labyrinthine plot of this movie. Stop <laughs> talking about Cruz's muscles. <laughs> okay, so they, there's like um, a vent and it has all these lasers that if you if you touch them and the most contrived thing it's like just put this little thingy thingy yeah. and it's one line yeah I, sure i know i was like <laughs> so wait they block it with some metal and it doesn't set off any alarms how many i mean how many movies were you have Come to on. step here and step there but not there and step here this is like no 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 we we'll just take the little wavy lines and make it one line and you just walk right over like all right movie i know i was sure i was like wow okay that was easy this oh this That's really isn't impossible very convenient yeah yeah okay so ethan is propelled down into the room well he says absolute silence and to the movie's credit that's exactly what happens suddenly the movie becomes deathly quiet and it's wonderful yeah because prior to mr Krasinski making his quiet place films i've never seen a film certainly a mainstream movie that demanded audiences to shut up and not say a thing and everyone's holding their breath great. I mean, that's how it was when I saw it in the theater. It was like, people were just like, (gasps) because, I mean, you know, we're, and and everything is agonizing. It's agonizing when we know that Dunlow is coming back or or trying to get back to his office because he's got the squirts. And, (laughs) you know, and meanwhile, there's a bit with John Renault and there's a rat that's, that's, you know, about to freak him out in the van. Like, there's all, you know, all these wonderful little things that are making this, you know, possible mission even more impossible. I I love this scene because it's, it becomes, not only is the editing so crisp, but like, it's, it's about like how quiet it is. And it's like, shh, quiet, quiet. Like, you you feel like you as the audience are going to disturb the movie because it's so quiet. I mean, when Dudlow actually does come back into the room and Cruz is just like hanging over him. Oh, that's great. That that's terrifying, and then of course he's got to run to the bathroom again, and um, and then when I would have loved to have seen like how can Ethan Hunt talk his way out of that? Oh no, that... I'm dusting. Sorry, man. <laughs> cleaning new cleaning crew. <laughs> hey man, I'm from Cirque du Soleil. Sorry, I'm just I'm just practicing. I'm your new partner. I'm gonna watch the desk for you from up here. <laughs> that would be so crazy. Yeah, new cleaning crew. Yeah, I guess that that was one way to do it. No, there's no way Dunlo would like be hitting every like emergency button in there. Oh, Ethan would have snapped his neck like a twig. Let's face it. I, you think? 
No, Krieger would have. Ethan yeah. would have, like, you know, just punched him really hard. But at one point, Krieger almost <clears throat> drops him, and he's, you know, two inches over. Yeah, and that's that amazing shot where yeah. Cruz is like, dun, 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 with the arms outstretched. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Yeah. And his, like, sweat coming off his glasses. Oh, he that's has to amazing. catch. Oh, that's so cool. He has cool. to catch his own sweat. Apparently, the first couple times they did that shot where, where Ethan Hunt, you know, almost eats the floor and stops, like, inches in front of it. Apparently, like, Cruz had to put pennies into his shoes to make it even. Because apparently the first couple times, his head just smacked against the floor. Yeah. This is a very hard movie to make, apparently. Well, yeah, of course. Do you know how much core strength you have to have to pull off this stunt? That's true. And balance. You sound like Janelle and right now. now I sound like Janelle. Yeah. Like, wow, he's amazing. <laughs> okay, but <laughs> but Hunt gets the the stuff he needs off of the computer, right? Yeah, very quickly. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. mean, it doesn't feel like it's that quick, but... Well, you know, it's like all these 90s movies where it's like, you know, one bar and then two bars. Like, come on, three <laughs> bars to go. Come on. <laughs> It's like the like the laziest you know way to generate suspense, but oh, we all we all fell for it. Yeah. So he finally gets pulled up, and then um, Krieger drops, drops his knife, oh, and it just lands in like the perfect spot. It's so badass. It really is. Because it's like Dunlow comes back in there, everything's normal except for this knife that's been embedded. That's like is Rambo been in here? Like yeah. it's crazy. <laughs> and and by the way, and the rat eats it. That's like the one truly vicious casualty. Yeah, but then Dunlow gets busted. Because they know that that the list is now. Do you think he gets busted, or do you think like yeah, they're sending him to Alaska? Do you think that's code for um? He doesn't know. Does this smell like chloroform to you? (laughs) And he like you know wakes up you know like in a trash compactor. And I'm like, you know what? This dude had one job. Yeah. With the highest security imaginable freaking dunlow that thing with the stupid drop off your off your little juicy juice cup the other day, and now this. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he lost. The list. Do you think maybe a year later, Dunlow's like, you know, the manager of like a blockbuster video. Like, you know, I used to work at Langley. I used to work at, you know, I used to have top security clearance, you know. I used to have a cushy job. I used to wear a suit and tie. Now look at me. I'm wearing this white shirt. Yes. I can tell you where, where I can tell you where Weekend at Bernie's is. Follow me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think his boss, like Kittredge, I think he sends him to Alaska. He's probably just like at some post in the freezing cold <laughs> where there's like no people and that's like where he has to spend the rest of his life. No honey pots available, nothing. Well, there's honey pots there, but you know. No. I don't think so. In Alaska? Not in his office. He's like the only one. I, I what would CIA headquarters in Alaska even look like? That's the thing. They're sending him to no man's land <laughs> because he Is failed. It- I mean, is it like a trailer, like surrounded, like on the edge of a mountain? Yeah, he failed snow? the easiest job in the CIA. <laughs> Literally. Yeah, yeah. I mean, come on. <sighs> Man, poor Dunlow. Yeah, all right. So then, um, all right, so now we're in the third act where mm-hmm. we find out what's really been going on. Dun, 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 dun. Where now there's actually three moles. So Jim, Claire... And Krieger. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this is a this is one of the most confusing parts of the film. And for me, it always has been because it's it's easy to understand on some level, but it's the informa- the way it's presented is very convoluted. So Cruz goes to make a phone call out in public because this is 1996. We're we're still crazy about payphones. He uses he's making a call. Yeah, in fact, he has a moment where he's calling Kittredge. Hangs up the phone and suddenly Jim Phelps is there. And we're having a moment like, oh, okay, this is another nightmare sequence. It's not. Um, So the two sit down, have this conversation, and it's very mentally fatherly. And um, Ethan Hunt asks him to basically go over what happens the night of of the ambush of the original IMF team. And... What we're it's an interesting back and forth. It's a, it's a cool way to do it, but like it's very confusing if you're not hip to what's going on initially. So we're seeing what Jim Phelps, John Voight is telling us his version of what happened, and then we're seeing exactly what happened. Mm-hmm. And uh, Ethan Hunt understands they keep cutting back to the violent way that all of his team members were dispatched. That's actually what happened, and Ethan Hunt gets it, but he's pulling a poker face. Okay. So it's very confusing because even the first time I saw this, like, wait, 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 is this, you know, is this subjective? Is this a fantasy? Is this like, you know, because it, it felt like such a contrast from the tone of the conversation. What tips us off 
is that Ethan has a moment where he actually says how he genuinely feels. He goes, why, Jim? And, Jim, you know, Jim goes like, well, because, you know, the president won't let us do whatever we want anymore. You know, we're obsolete. Like he talks about, you know, being a dinosaur. Yeah, he just and this basically is, wants the money. Yeah, exactly. So it's like it's, you know, but but it's also it's very much hypothetical because it's like, why, Jim, would this happen? Why, Jim, would someone do this? So the conversation continues to be pleasant. And Jim, I don't think, is aware that Ethan knows. Mm. I don't think. So what so what? we're seeing as audience is what actually happened. Ethan Hunt is actually understanding. Yes, exactly. He's putting it all together. And you know, the way Cruz plays it is very good because it's it's like the horror of realizing everything that actually happened. Um, And because he's, because Jim is his mentor and he knows him so well. And, you know, so he understands like, yeah, this is probably how he murdered them. This is, this is how Krieger was utilized. This is how Claire was utilized. They were all like instruments of murder um, over this team that had become like a very comfortable family unit. Mm -hmm. All right. So now we're on the train. Right. Right. There's the bit where Ethan comes back to the apartment and Claire is like in a sleeping bag hunched in the corner. Oh, yeah. That's so weird. Yeah. Because I mean, I understand that she's nervous and she's waiting for Ethan, but like, I don't know. I mean, did you think Jean Renault and and Finn Graham's like, couch is mine. (laughs) I know. I'm like, wait, where? Why is she? What? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's like it, it's Emmanuel and, Baird. And you give she, her a nice place and was to sleep. She kind of coming on to hunt. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and he doesn't fall for it because he knows. Yes. That she's a mole. Yes. She doesn't know. She doesn't, she doesn't know, know that he knows. That he knows yeah. that we know. Yeah. We don't, we don't so know. again, it's convoluted, especially the first time you see it. I mean, for me, like the more you see it, the more it connects. But yeah, this bit was so confusing to me in the theater. So now we see that uh, Max, Cougar Max, is um, <laughs> on the train. She's like, talking- where's Ethan? Where yeah. is he? Yeah, she's talking to him on the phone, and she's like, um, hello, like, where are you? And he's like, put your hand under your seat. And she's like, the, ooh, the, I'd love to. The disc is basically in, in a pocket under your seat. It's like, how do these things get put in the right spot? Like This how- is like an Oprah move right here. <laughs> you get the disc, and you get the disc. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, they're trying to get all the information, but Luther is blocking the signal, and then he gets interrupted. But the, so they're trying Kitches to like, is on the train. Yeah. yeah. So it, there's like a lot of moving pieces here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Claire is. Claire goes to the back of the train where yeah. she encounters Jim, and she's like, "Do we have to kill Ethan? Yeah. Like I really like him. <laughs> Can we just like let him go and like get the money? And yeah. Like go? and Kittridge is on the train, so we need to get out of here. This is like not a because safe place. Because Ethan now knows where the money is because he gave Max the disc. Yeah. And then what? It, so it's a bit where Ethan does like a David Copperfield with the disc, which I've always done. It's a cool moment. And Claire is talking to Jim, but then it's really Ethan dun, dun, with dun, his dun, mask. Dun. Yeah. I love with these his... ILM effects. Yeah. Pull, yeah. Suddenly John Voight's face. Gets yanked off, and it's Tom Cruise underneath. And then the real Jim shows up. Yes, which is goofy because he's just been sitting there the whole time, like, okay, I'm gonna wait. And now, surprise! <laughs> he's got a gun. And he's got like his his escape outfit on. So, yeah, it's kind of this thing. It's, it's yeah, it's a lot of talking villainy, and yeah. then of course the the great line. I'm like, here's the line that is never gonna appear in a movie again. It's like they stamped it, didn't they? Those damn Gideons. Oh, yeah, because he, he's like, oh, the Bible. The Bible was the tip-off. But it, like I was telling you, like, I've never understood that. So what the film is telling us is that Jim Phelps, for all his, you know, all his villainy, his duplicitousness, and, and you know, the way he's a double agent, and in some ways a triple agent, and he's, he's screwing IMF, and he's basically out for himself, and his wife is in on it. This guy, I, I guess that this makes him truly evil. He stole a Bible from the Drake Hotel. He's like, I'm going to need this because I'm going to use this when I'm going to be Job and I'm going to need to know my Bible verses. And apparently there's nothing on this new thing called the Internet to tell me what the verses are. So I need to carry this physical copy of the Bible with me. I got to remember to get rid of this thing later on because it says that I was at the Drake Hotel. But never mind. Okay, here we go. So Job 317. And he keeps it there. And, of course, Ethan conveniently for like, Hey, wait a yeah, second. Yeah, you see him like dr- placed here by the Gideons Drake Hotel. Wait a minute. Wait a second. And there's a room tab in here. It says Jim Phelps <laughs> stayed in this room and he watched some adult <laughs> movies on Cablevision. <laughs> they 
<laughs> Jim, you've been a bad man. <laughs> Those you, damn Gideons. You hypocrite, Jim. You hypocrite. Um, yeah, it's like, really? The Bible is the thing that like gives it away? Look, you know, Robert Town, David Kep, I applaud you both for trying to make this work. It's 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 kind of it's a little ridiculous, but okay. I mean, it's cool. I mean, look, if we're gonna really get into it, it's a moral thing, right? Because because on the one hand, he's going like, look, you're not so good yourself. Remember, thou shalt not covet with thy neighbor's wife. So he's literally quoting one of the Ten Commandments. And but it's also about. I mean, this is also about like it. it it's a satanic fall. It's like about about an ultimate fall from good. Um, about you know someone who used to be in favor with God no longer is. So if anything, it, it is dealing with the hypocrisy among the father son mentor mentee relationship going on mm. here. So I think like they are they are tipping their hat in that direction because it's like this is this is the level of fall of grace. This is someone who is good and now truly evil, and this is also Ethan who is sinning, but he is ostensibly the hero of this film, even though he's impetuous and uh, really should stay away from John Voight's wife. Yeah, <clears throat> which is why I think they should have kept that scene in the I beginning. I agree with you, and apparently it was I'm a, like, yeah, I've never seen it. I don't know if it's uh, forgive me. I've never, I don't know if it's online, but apparently it's a good scene. It's a really well choreographed scene. It's like a wonder, and they're like, and you see a little snippet of it in the elevator. And it's like, oh, I guess Tom Cruise has a love interest in this movie, and because that's not there, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, then when, when he's like, I've, t- I've tasted the goods, and I knew you would fall for Claire, and it's like, did they fall? Yeah, like, I know. He frisks her and she like, you know, wants some comfort when she's in the sleeping bag. He's like, I'm going to bed. It's like, I don't know if this is really what we call chemistry. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. I was like, wait, did he cover his neighbor's wife? Yeah, I, 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 I agree. There's no evidence of that in the movie now. It should have been clear because the movie is a little over two hours and they probably could have. I mean, it would have been fine for like four more minutes. And when he says like, I've tasted the goods and I knew you'd fall for it. Like, I was like, wait. No. It's like, dude, that's inappropriate. I barely know this woman. <laughs> yeah, well, as a viewer, yeah, because yeah. we don't know because we don't haven't seen the deleted scene. It's like, oh man, like, that's kind of creepy. Like they're buds. Yeah, exactly. Like you're weird. What? We're not friends with benefits, but they were. Yeah. yeah. So that that's confusing. Yeah. All right. Well, Ethan gives the money to Jim, and Jim shoots Claire by accident. <laughs> I guess. Kind of. Kind of. But um. Jim like takes off after that and leaves Ethan to comfort her because she's dying. Well, it's like he could always buy another wife. Come on. Well, he did just get like twenty million dollars. Yeah, so he's he's good. He's got those bearer bonds. I didn't even know what that was until Die Hard came out. Yeah. Like mun- mun- municipal bearer bonds. This is a thing. And they're tiny. Why do people rob banks? You should. Everyone should be just stealing bearer bonds. Yeah. It's like coupons. And it, and it's a lot smaller. You don't have to carry a so, whole briefcase. Oh man! Like I don't, there are Carl's Jr. coupons that aren't as big as these bearer bonds. Yeah, like they're very convenient. <laughs> yeah. All right. So this takes us to the roof of the bullet train. Oh man! This amazing scene. It still looks good. Man, 1996 special effects still looks good. It looks like they're on top of the train, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it does. It doesn't get a, the effects don't get a little wonky and CGI until they're in the tunnel. That's when it's like, oh, okay. But yeah, on top of the train, it's awesome. Cruz does these amazing backflips and he's really just on a sound stage just doing this stuff with a with a huge um with with this gigantic air blower. Well, so this is before Cruz was like, "No man, I'm doing all my own stunts for real." Yeah, well, well I mean, this is before he's hanging on the side of a plane like, "Do you get this? Are you filming?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah no this is yeah it's uh but it looks it looks wonderful at so much so that i if i if you were to tell someone like yeah Cruz does all his own stunts i think people would buy it it looks pretty cool um yeah it's a great sequence um it's exciting the music is used sparingly because the, the, the sound effects and the visuals are awesome um, I can't say enough of good stuff about this scene. I mean, th- th- this is the scene that most people love about the movie. People who like had no idea what was going on. It's like, did you? Yeah, but did you see that train scene at the end? That's like awesome. I mean, that's like why we go to summer movies. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of jumping around, and as I was telling you, like, man, I love it that not once but twice. Not only does Ethan Hunt think to get in his pocket and get this, you know, this piece of gum out, but he does it with one hand. Well, and I'm like, wait. And the other hand, he's holding pieces, onto a helicopter. How many pieces of gum does he have? That's true. I guess, like, I mean, did did uh, did Emilio give him like a stick of this stuff? Because he has pack? two. Yeah, like a pack of yeah, like he's he's got two at least. Here's a pack of gum, man. Use it wisely. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Do you think it was like 
kaboom gum. <laughs> it just says he like made a little fake like it's like logo. a picture. It's like a picture of him like giving the thumbs up. It's like kaboom gum. That would be awesome. Yeah, that should have been a running gag for the other films. Now the only thing. I- so Ethan like attaches the helicopter to the bullet train mm-hmm. and that's why this it is the has same to move go that, yeah. into the channel. This is the same thing that Dr. Peyton Westlake does in Dark Man. And in, in that case, the helicopter immediately explodes. But in this case, the helicopter just yeah, flies in. I, I just don't buy that the helicopter like makes it through the channel. Oh, well, it wasn't long. attached to a helicopter. But would you believe in 2006, a helicopter actually did this? With a train? No. Just, just flying on its own. Is that See, nuts? that's the thing. Like to keep like the the speed of the train and the speed of the helicopter. Like I, I just don't think it would have lasted this long. I think I think it. <laughs> really, he's really good at flying. Because at one point he tries to decapitate. Yeah. He tries to weaponize the helicopter and actually cut off Tom Cruise's I head know. at one point. I'm like, this guy. He's not. Is he that great of a pilot that he can like do all this stuff? He's like the maverick of helicopters. I guess. And then, but no, what really takes it down is the explosive gum. Not, not like a wobbly move by the pilot. No, man. It's, it's that, is that weaponized Baba Yaba. It explodes and like, and, and John Voigne is immediately crushed by the helicopter, which is awesome. But yeah, it's that big money shot that was in every trailer. It's so amazing. The shot that's, it's from a distance away and you see the explosion propels Tom Cruise like right up to the camera lens. It's awesome. That's I love awesome. that shot so much. And then there's, you know, the train obviously stops and the <laughs> one of the conductors just like faints like, I can't believe what I just saw. Yes. Yeah. Great. Great stuff. So Max has to give back the disc to the CIA. Oh, man. Man, she's really bummed. Our favorite cougar arms dealer is going to jail for a very, very long no, time. No, no, she's not going to jail. You think she's really going to get out of that? Yeah, because the guy, Kittred says like... Because she's like, I'm gonna. My lawyers are gonna have a hate. Oh, you know this. what I bet he's like. You know, I got. You know, Max. Rather than put you in maximum security prison, we have a job opening at Langley. We have this room. <laughs> we got this guy, this dipstick that totally screwed up. <laughs> all you gotta do is sit in this room and just not let anything go wrong. That's all we ask you to do. Can you do that? She's like, Will Ethan Hunt come visit me? <laughs> we could probably provide that. You also get a 401k and dental. <laughs> no, he's like... There's no more arms dealing and just watch this room. That's all you got to do. No, no, because Kittredge was like, no, we don't need to get the police involved. I'm sure you... And she's like, oh, I bet I have information you could use. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to know whatever happened to her. Because I know... Cause is she not in any... She's not, but Kittredge is in... The character of Kittredge and, and Henry Kazernsey, he's in the new one. Oh. Mission Impossible Dead Dead Reckoning Part 1 That's the title Oh wow Yeah yeah I can't wait to see it And yeah he's in it But yeah we never I, I don't think we ever know What happened to To Max the Cougar arms Arms dealer man That's funny So then we see Ethan and Luther Kind of Saying their goodbyes Broing it up Broing it up And Ethan kind of seems to me like he's like, yeah, man, I'm not like I'm I'm getting out of the life now. I'm not going to do this anymore. You know what this feels like? It feels like a reshoot. It feels oh. like this is something they probably put in the movie later. Um, Cruz's hair is a little different here. And the tone of the scene is very much like, oh, we like this character. We, these two should have one more scene together. I, I don't mind the scene. It's It's nice after all the chaos that we just witnessed. But it does feel like. Okay, like especially if we want to bring Ving Rhames back, which of course they oh. did. It's like we need to we need to get these guys established. And it's like these are the only two characters left. Oh, I see. That yeah. that does make sense. I mean, the only other thing that he should have done, we should have had a scene where um, Ethan goes to a cemetery and he goes to Jack Harmon's grave and puts like a stick of gum on it. <laughs> what? <laughs> but not. Love well, you, buddy. Red he light, doesn't explode green light. him though, does he? Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> Like walks away, and in the background you see <laughs> this tombstone just explodes. Oh yeah, I'm sure his family would love that. <laughs> the family's like, "Stupid Ethan Hunt, told Jack never to hang out with that guy." Oh no, you can't do that. Okay, it does make more sense because the the final scene he's on the plane, and that was probably the only final scene. You know, I I yeah. I really feel like that scene with Ving Rhames and Cruz was like we got to get this in here because audiences are wondering whatever happened to him if, you know, if he got arrested too at the end. And you know, it's right. very it's a, it's a lot of like okay, hey, I'm not dis- I'm not on this avowed list. You and I are good. Let's yeah, yeah. let's do this again sometime. Yeah. Yeah. And then he gets another mission. 
on the plane. Or so we think. Or so we think. The stewardess. This is back when they were stewardesses. Yes. Don't bite my head off. They were called stewardesses. <laughs> Sky chicks. This is what she... <laughs> Sky waitress. Sky waitress. <laughs> Flight att- the flight attendant that was goes from up. A previous episode. Previous episode. Oh man, we can't be quoting our prior episodes. <laughs> so the the flight attendant goes up to Ethan. She knows his name. Like no one's ever called me. Like hello, Barry She's Worst. She's a CIA agent. Well, that's the thing. But again, I'm 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 wondering. Like, is it really? Because because the ending is kind of like a question. Because she offers him the cinema of the Caribbean and Aruba. And on the one hand, it's like, okay, we think this is full circle that he's being, you know... Uh, yeah, because that's what happened to John Voight. Or is she just offering him a, the opportunity to watch a bunch of art movies that no, he will not want to watch? Because she said... I don't like subtitles. Because she said, do you want to watch a movie? And he was like, no. And then she's like, can I interest you in Cinema of the Caribbean? Ooh, do you think that's like, you know, we got some other kind of movies maybe oh, you might like to watch. No. And we got this lady in first class... Her name is uh, Maxine. <laughs> she would like to watch some cinema of Aruba with you, if you know what I mean. I think you do, Mr. Hunt. <laughs> oh my dun, gosh. dun, dun, dun. Yeah, she wants to join the Mile High Club with you. <laughs> That's a whole other Mission Impossible movie. Yeah. It would be Mission Impossible with the size of those bathrooms. So, anyway. Oh, man. Well, that's I'm liking it. that film. So th- this film, like it, 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 w- it had a very famously troubled production. Although they, Paramount kind of kept a lid on it, but this, they shot most of the film, and you know they, they really worked on it. This was the first film that Cruz was ever a producer on. It was supposed to open Christmas of 1995, and it wound up getting pushed all the way to summer of '96. But I remember going to see Sabrina, the Harrison Ford film, and they had the teaser trailer to Mission Impossible, and it just blew the roof off so for me like I, I love this movie because it's thrilling it's elegant um it's not easy to understand the first time you see it like a lot of spy thrillers like i love that it, it is complex it you know the action sequences are incredible but it really is about the duplicity of being a spy um and it was a humongous hit even though it, you know it had a really divisive response from fans the original idea as i understand it was that with every new mission impossible movie they wanted a different director who was an auteur so they wanted a filmmaker with a very distinct visual and directorial style so the first one's like de palma and with the second one the second one was supposed to be oliver stone um cruz was in camp kubrick making eyes wide shut so stone was like i gotta i I can't keep waiting so when cruz finally came back from making eyes wide shut he ended up making mission impossible 2 with john woo you know and john woo's got a very distinct visual style and so does the movie um but with the third one it went out the window um the third one they got jj abrams i believe to do the third one the third third one is probably my least favorite to tell you the truth it's very it's more plot heavy than the other ones and it's very sentimental which i don't really like but then the fourth one was brad bird the director of the incredibles and ghost protocol was the one that really got this series going because uh you know Ghost protocol was awesome it's great because when the third one came out that's when the whole oprah couch thing happened everyone's like we don't like tom cruise anymore because he dances on couches and he likes katie holmes everybody freaked out about that (laughs) but here's what happened this is interesting though paramount they were uncomfortable with that and they were planning to kill off cruise from this franchise mission impossible 4 this is true wow because of for one thing the box office that's the real issue the box office for mission impossible 3 was not great and you know it it, it really wasn't a big hit so what Paramount was going to do with Mission Impossible 4, this is true. They were going to have Ethan Hunt killed off, and they were going to have the new IMF team led by Brad Pitt. Whoa. Brad Pitt was looking to do a big franchise movie. Um, he had just done Mr. and Mrs. Smith, and he was looking to do, like, a, what's a film I could do, like, a bunch of. So he ended up, Pitt ended up doing World War Z instead. That was, like, his big Hollywood film, and it worked out really well for him. But, yeah, like, that was the plan. And Cruz apparently was like, no, let me like, let me just try something else. Like, you know, and they're like, okay, you're the producer. And most of our biggest hits are Tom Cruise movies. So like, we'll let Tom Cruise like really swing big for the fourth one. So Ghost Protocol was a humongous hit. And uh, I think Rogue Nation was the next one. And mm-hmm. I, that's probably my favorite of the later films. I think Rogue, Na- Rogue Nation is an incredible action movie. And then Fallout was the most recent one. Um, yeah, but no, Cruz, you know, for, and look, it's, it's the couch thing is neither here nor there. The third one just isn't that great. Um, people tend to think the second one's their least favorite, but look, if you love John Woo, you gotta love the second one. The second one's great. It's visual. It's a rich visual feast, 
But um, now I feel like I need to watch all of them. You should. They're great. And Christopher McQuarrie has just been he's been directing the the most recent ones and he's been doing a dynamite job. He's a great action film director. Um, I mean, this this series has become about Tom Cruise doing these insane stunts and they become like Jackie Chan films. Like, do people even see these movies for the plot anymore? Or do they want to see just how how close this mega movie star comes to death every time? Um, Cruise is great in all these films, every one of them. Um, he's investing a lot into the role of Ethan Hunt. Um, I would argue that that his performance and I think the charisma of the character and 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 him as a movie star are in sync. It's not just the insane stunts, but I mean, let's face it. I mean, the, the poster for the new one is him on a motorcycle going off a cliff. So clearly, people are going for the insane stunts. Okay, well, I I don't I love the insane stunts, but I need to have the plot make sense. Like that was why I never watched wanted to watch this movie again because mm. I was like I didn't understand. The plots it the first get a time. lot easier to understand yeah. from here on out. Yeah. yeah, I mean maybe audiences are like dumber now and we're like just give us something easy because the first one was so difficult. But now that we, I mean, watching it now, like. Well, the first film is, it. yeah, the first film is like, you know, it's the, it's North by Northwest or it's the man that knew too much. The second film is notorious. Remember that Hitchcock film? Mm. It's notorious because he's in love with Tan, Tan Newton, and Newton. And Tanavay Newton was previously in a relationship with the bad guy. Doug Tandy Sk- Newton? She goes by Tanavay now. Oh. Yeah. Since when? Okay. I didn't know that. It was that. established that Tandy was uh, not her decision, former okay. slave name. All so right. she goes you by Tandy Bay. All right. Well, just in case you didn't know. I didn't know. So, yeah. So it's it's the love triangle between three people in the same way Hitchcock's Notorious was. So that's the second mm. film. The third film is this whole domestic thing where he's with Michelle Monaghan. And, you know, it's like he's – he's it's almost like a true lies kind of thing where he's with her. Um you know, it's like going back and forth between being who he is. And then we get to Rebecca Ferguson in the series, which is really cool because Ferguson's character is like, she's basically the female equivalent of Ethan Hunt. Yeah. So he's finally found like his, I mean, she's, she, I mean, they, they completely hold their own with each other. I probably need to see number three again because like the Michelle Monaghan stuff where she keeps coming back in the like subsequent movies where he's just like watching her from a distance right. i'm like this is so lame it'll make a little more sense and be a little more like, touching why can't they just like be together the one thing that i really loved in the third film of all things uh, uh philip seymour hoffman weird choice for a villain um opposite tom cruise and when they have a fist fight it's like oh that there's no way that would there's no way he would land a punch on tom cruise but he has this amazing monologue where cruise captures them and uh, instead of giving him the information he wants, Philip Seymour Hoffman just looks at him and goes, do you have a wife, uh, someone you love and care about? I'm going to find them and I'm going to hurt them. And then I'm going to kill you in front of them. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, it's a great monologue. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's killer. And what does Tom Cruise do? He Because op- they're in a plane. He opens the cockpit door and sticks his head out the plane window mm-hmm. and as, to retaliate. Oh. And later on in the movie, Cruz is like, don't do that. And he's like, you stuck my head out of plane. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this, look, the, the third film isn't bad. It's not a bad film at all. But I mean, compared to the others, it just, I don't know, for me, it's it's neither here nor there. Okay. Well, if anybody wants to watch this movie. It's on Paramount Plus currently. Yep. Currently. Pluto TV, or you can rent it on Prime Video. Or if you're like me. If you want to come to my house and just borrow my VHS copy, I bought this movie the day (laughs) it arrives at Blockbuster Video. Because this was back when Blockbuster started selling movies the day they arrived. So you could buy them or sell them or rent them. And I bought a widescreen copy. So I still have my widescreen Mission Impossible video cassette if any of you want to borrow it. Which we did not pull out for this. No, I'm I'm not going to go through those boxes and find that (laughs) video cassette. Let's just watch it on TV. Yeah. No, I love this movie. This is one of my favorite summer movies. I've got great memories, obviously, of seeing it with my buddies. And uh, this is a smart film. Um, I wish more summer movies were this good. And this is is De Palma on on top of his game. De Palma is always just a real wizard. But uh, this is a visually brilliant film. Four stars for you? Yes. All right. How about you? Yeah, I'd give it four stars. Now that I get it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, would you fun. would you want it to end differently? Um, I do. no, because all of these movies they all end kind of with these like, okay, what's the next mission gonna be? So I I, don't I do that. think there should be a little button at the end of the film where after you know deciding to do his mission, Cruz like you know gets up, he goes to the restroom, knocks the door, 
opens up and it's Vanessa Redgrave and is like, hello. And then the movie ends. Oh, oh. dun, 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be that would i mean i wouldn't i don't mind like that those kinds of things and like these movies are like um bond movies you know well bond the, can't keep his I, hands I, off of what, his co-stars okay, but what i'm saying is it is fun for them to like flirt with those like funny sexy things with the characters and leave you hanging and you never really know what happened yeah 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 all right. Well, I think that does it. I think so. All right. So, well, thank you for watching this with me because uh, I've always loved this movie and I'm glad it made a little more sense. Hopefully listening to this at home and made a little more sense the way we explained it. Or maybe it just made it so much more confusing. Yeah. Maybe it's really convoluted and you never want to watch it again. So you're welcome. Just be careful. Remember, if you're going to chew gum, make sure you don't chew the gum that has uh, different colors on it. <laughs> okay. One solid color. All right. Well, that concludes our discussion of Mission Impossible. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone.